After producing a handful of tracks in this country, Hinawehi Mohi spent some time in Europe playing with Killing Joke in Crowded House and recording in the UK with Killing Joke crew Jazz Coleman and Youth. Now back home and working on her debut album, we got together to hear some of her history. In my time of doing music, I've met lots of incredible musos and um, I've got a lot of inspiration from, from those people, songwriters, musicians, singers. And Mahi Narangi Toka is one person that I've admired for a long time and I love her vocal uniqueness and her beautiful lyrics to her songs and I just, I'm surprised that um, she hasn't been picked up and, and um, really um, moved ahead with her music because she's just so talented. And I was thinking about doing another single and um, a few years ago and, and she'd always said to me, you know, Henry, I'd love you to sing some of my stuff. So I went over to her place one day and she, she gave me a couple of tracks that um, she thought I might like to work with and uh, I chose The Myth because I thought the lyrics were so cool. It was a bit of a laugh because um, I was working with a muso, JD, and JD comes from that folk, uh, sort of funk soul um, kind of groove, you know, from Zadija influence and um, and just the sort of music he likes, you know. We were sort of a similar age, and uh, so we kind of grew up with, with all those kind of grooves in our head, you know, calling the gang and all that sort of stuff. So we do um, have a similar. Um, love for that kind of music and um, he was just sort of getting his own studio established in his home and <laughs> he didn't really sort of allow for a vocal booth so we did the recording in the closet <laughs> so it was really hot I was ended up stripping off my clothes and doing it in the dark because getting the light on was too hot and <laughs> I was pretty out of it and Portuguese was um, essentially it was meant to be a ballad but it ended up being sort of a the hoppy thing that lots of young people like. I'd like to bring in more of the traditional instrumentation, something that Moana has been developing as well uh, with a guy called Hedini Melbourne. And Hedini Melbourne has um, brought out of the woodwork a lot of instrumentation that we thought had gone forever really and the number of instruments that um, you can get these incredibly unique sounds out of um, that he's bringing up is, is really excellent and it just gives it a, a very um, environmental as well as um, realistic flavour to the music and that's what I'd like to, to work on as well. I got uh, together with them just to sort of like go over the ideas. It wasn't like, you know, a concentrated sort of MIDI system session before going and, and recording it. It was just kind of like went over to Youth's place and, um, and I says, well, Youth, you know, what ideas have you got for the track? And he goes, yeah, he, I'm looking for, you know, man, it's like um, your dub ambient Maori vibe, man. <laughs> so we come up with this dub ambient Maori vibe, <laughs> and um, I think it's it's pretty amazing. I just uh, met up with the, the brothers at um, the Brixton Studio Butterfly, which is youth studio, and um, we just kind of waited around for Greg Hunter. <laughs> and, and then um, a couple of hours later, he, arrived, he turned up, and, and we just kind of got in there and just whacked some ideas together, and it just sort of had this little um, escalating episode where all the different influences of, of those musicians and where I was coming from. Also, we worked with um, Gerard Tahu 
and, um, and Godfrey Rudolph, who are two Māori fellas over there, and um, they basically put down some haka rhythms and, and um, some sort of chanty kind of vibes within um, the, the techno dub sound that we came up with from, from Youth Nim's influence, and then I just kind of put my melody floating over, over the top of it. The track is, is very much, it's basically the roots of it is a, a waiata that I wrote about my grandfather who died when my father was just a baby. And it's all in Māori from that perspective. And I just basically sang to jazz and, um, and he arranged the music to complement it around that. And of course, you know, it's got a killing, jo killing joke influence in it. Um, that was all pretty much MIDI stuff, but there's a little bit of live element with Miguel doing percussion, beautiful congas with sound in it. Um, and we've also got um, uh, Komatua doing um, English, not a translation of the song, but the sentiment of the song comes out in an English voiceover narration, which is kind of like your Vincent Price kind of eerie vibe. <laughs> and uh, it's come together really well. I think it's captured quite a bit of of the essence of Waiata Māori and tried to bring it into a contemporary sort of um, feel. When I've played my music that I'm doing now to friends that have enjoyed my music that I, I did with the more Afro-American influence and um, Māori people are sort of, I think it's just a little bit difficult for them to get used to. Um, I find that a lot of Barka people really get off on it because it's really different and very unique and it really went off to, um, to the crowd that I played it to in England. I think because probably in England, overseas, there's much more diverse appreciation of music, world music scene and alternative music and they're always hunting for something new and unique. Whereas over here, we sort of tend to copy everything. So um, the appreciation of my music taking a different, different tangent is um, perhaps yet to be fully appreciated. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> After the break, a ballad from Hinawehi Mohi and some Bail to Space. <laughs> 